Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Obama's efforts on Iran's sanctions fall short of expectations. Israel condemned at Turkey summit. And the land of the two rivers faces water shortages. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The United Nations Security Council will vote today on a draft resolution calling for new sanctions on Iran. This comes after five months of negotiations between the United States, the UK, France, Germany, Russia and China. The new draft resolution calls for imposing measures on Iranian banks abroad if they are suspected of having links with Iran's nuclear program or missiles. The draft resolution calls for monitoring money transfers between Iranian banks, including the Central Bank of Iran. The draft resolution also calls for expanding the weapons ban that is already imposed by the UN on Tehran. It also calls on establishing a system for inspecting goods and cargo shipments headed to Iran. This system is similar to the one that is in use for North Korea. The draft resolution calls on the UN to blacklist 40 Iranian companies and freeze their funds all over the world. They are suspected of supporting Iran's nuclear and missile programs. This marks a new turning point in the tense relations between Iran and the leading powers, as the UN Security Council is about to impose new sanctions on Iran over its nuclear program. This is the fourth time that such sanctions are imposed on Iran. However, this time these sanctions are somewhat different. For the first time, the Iranians find themselves confronting all the permanent members of the UN Security Council. China and Russia have agreed to impose the sanctions on Iran, which was praised by the United States. وهو أمر كان محل حفاوة وشنط I think it will be fair to say that these sanctions will be the toughest that Iran has faced. In addition, the international community is very united. These sanctions are also different for another reason, which is that they aim to suffocate Iran's military and economic sectors. This is not a, a, a resolution comprised of voluntary... The draft resolution is not composed of voluntary measures. This draft resolution contains serious and new measures. We are very happy with its content. It is a strong and expanded resolution and will have a major impact on Iran. This is why Iran has worked so hard to prevent the draft resolution from being adopted. The draft resolution calls for the ban of the sale of tanks, advanced defense systems and combat planes. It also calls on member countries to inspect all cargo shipments that enter or leave Iran. The draft resolution also includes measures against Iran's banking sector. It seems that the West is determined to implement these measures. Iran think, you know, wants to portray itself as the victim here. Iran, Iran wants to portray itself as the victim. Iran is not a victim. Rather, it is a player in this project. It has insisted on giving up its international obligations. However, it seems that Tehran is more flexible. Iranian President Ahmadinejad responded to the recent developments by threatening not to come back to the negotiation table over his country's nuclear program. Ahmadinejad reiterated to Western countries that the agreement that his country reached with Turkey and Brazil to exchange low-level depleted uranium with that of higher levels is an opportunity that will not be repeated. Regardless of what happens, it seems that the new sanctions will add more fuel to the fire between Tehran and the West.
after holding the inconclusive elections that failed to produce a new government in Iraq, Iraqi President Jalal Talabani ordered the new parliament to hold its first session next Monday. Once in session, the new members of parliament must elect the president of the republic and the parliament speaker. The president of the republic will assign the candidate of the largest parliamentary bloc to form the new government within a month. Our correspondent, Shafiq Abdeljbar, reports from Baghdad. Next Monday is the day that was set by Iraqi President Jalal Talabani for the new parliament to convene for the first time. The Iraqi federal court has approved the election results at the beginning of this month. Following the court's ruling, the parliamentary blocks are mandated by the Constitution to meet within 15 days, even if an agreement has not been reached on the formation of the government. Democracy, which the world is trying to follow, says that the winner, even if by one vote, has the right to form the government. This is based on electoral and constitutional laws, as well as democratic principles. Alawi, who seems to be more confident and firmer in his tone, has reiterated his right and the right of his bloc to form the new government. He also dismissed rumors regarding the possible collapse of his coalition. On the other hand, the Iraqi State of Law Coalition is still exerting efforts to form an alliance with the National Party of Iraq. The Iraqi list has a better chance of forming the government because it has the largest number of parliamentary seats. We at the State of Law Coalition continue to hold talks with the National Coalition of Iraq. I humbly believe that we will stand united in the chamber of the parliament under one list led by one leader. We will be assigned to form the government. The rivals who didn't reach a political consensus behind closed doors will be forced to meet in the chamber of the parliament. Parliament, a meeting that is not raising the hopes of many people. At least it might be able to break the ice that has impeded the political process in Iraq. From Baghdad, Shafiq Abdel Jabbar, Dubai TV. The United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, UNESCO, warned that more than 100,000 Iraqis have been forced to leave their homes due to Iraq's water shortages. This is the result of the government's negligence in maintaining the wells and water networks and government officials' involvement in special deals in exchange for massive monetary gains. Al-Anbar province is this problem's best example. Iraq is known as the country that lies between the two rivers, for two great rivers run through it, nurturing the life that bloomed in this country. But today, people in Iraq are suffering from water shortages due to the reduction in water level of the two rivers, the Tigris and the Euphrates. Even when the water from the rivers was available, it was not suitable for agricultural usage or as drinking water. Most of the water gives us diarrhea, and I do not know what. Even the quantity is not enough. The bridge is called the Rawa Bridge. It's located in the heart of the city and divides the two sides apart. In the past, the water was high enough to cover all of its pillars. Now the water is below these pillars, proving that the water level has largely regressed. The water used to be high and strong. It used to irrigate people's farms. We had quality standards, and you could use the water for a lot of things. It used to be strong. Now the water is dirty. In this border village in Al Anbar, the residents, especially the farmers, suffer from the water shortage even though they're next to the Euphrates River. This compelled them to dig artesian wells in order to water their farms. But the water from these wells is salty and not suitable for watering the soil. In the near future, this soil will no longer be suitable for agriculture. Because of the low level and the scarcity of the water, we had to dig artesian wells. It affects the fertility of the soil. We are forced to do this. What can we do? We found out that we probably won't even be able to plant anything because of this water. 
نتيجة هاي المياه من هنا يدخل نهر الفرات إلى العراق From here, the Euphrates River enters Iraq and reaches Basra in its final band. From here, the Euphrates merges with the Tigris and they both merge into the Arab Gulf. One has to wonder, will the story of this struggle end soon because of the decreasing water level or will it remain what has been for thousands of years? American President Barack Obama will meet with Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas, who just arrived to Washington to discuss indirect peace talks between the Palestinians and the Israelis. The United States will mediate these talks, which come one week after the Israeli attack on the Freedom Flotilla, which was carrying aid to Gaza. A senior American official said that in addition to the indirect peace talks, which were resumed one month ago and given priority by the American State Department, the meeting between the two leaders leaders will also address the humanitarian situation in Gaza. A few days before his arrival to the American capital, Washington, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas said that his message to the American President, Barack Obama, will be to stress the need to take courageous positions that will bring change to the region and end the pain and suffering. He added that those positions should also end the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territories. Meanwhile, the White House has said that President Barack Obama is looking forward to talking with Abbas about the recent progress in the indirect peace talks, as well as the joint efforts exerted to achieve peace in the Middle East. Obama also wants to talk about what he called Washington's strong support of the Palestinian people through the Palestinian Authority and its efforts toward building a Palestinian state. The American president also wants to put in place a long-term strategy aimed at improving the life of Gaza's people. People. Expectations of the Obama Abbas summit are very pessimistic. We don't expect anything new. To the contrary, we expect the pressure on President Abu Mazen to increase, not decrease, especially right now. Although some people believe that Washington can still push the two sides of the conflict to move forward towards negotiations and mutual compromises and accept middle ground solutions, others believe that the tension between Washington and Netanyahu's government over the settlement issue and the Israeli attack on the Gaza flotilla will prevent Obama from achieving any progress in the peace talks. If the United States continues to have an unclear strategy, then it will fall into the trap that was set by Israel. The U.S. will become isolated and will remain silent about the collective punishment against the Palestinians and the human rights violations. On the Israeli side, those obligations include stopping settlements. The American president vowed to continue exerting pressure on Netanyahu and trying to convince the Israelis to conduct serious peace negotiations with the Palestinians. However, his administration faces challenges in achieving these objectives, which include the political divisions that came after the Israeli elections, as well as the internal Palestinian division between Fatah and Palestinian movements who reject the peaceful settlement with Israel, including Hamas. Anwar al Ansi, BBC. BBC. A number of Israeli and Palestinian sources have confirmed that Israel has partially eased its blockade on the Gaza Strip, allowing the entry of some previously banned food items. The British Daily Telegraph reported that Israel is willing to ease its blockade on the Gaza Strip if the international community accepts the formation of an internal Israeli committee to investigate the attack on the Gaza-bound flotilla. The British Daily said that Britain submitted a document last week calling on Israel to ease its blockade on Gaza. The newspaper added that an anonymous Western source familiar with the negotiations with Israel said that a deal is within reach. Meanwhile, during the Asian Cooperation Conference hosted in Istanbul, all participants, with the exception of Israel, condemned the Israeli attack on the aid flotilla. The U.S. said that the international participation in the investigation into the Israeli attack is key to defusing the crisis. Our correspondent Yusuf Shahrif in Turkey has the details. 
It's a gathering that is not easily described as its participants are torn by division and animosity. On one side you have Iran and Israel, and on the other you have Pakistan and India. They are all guests of Turkey, a country that is seeking to expand its role, both at the regional and international levels, by focusing on dialogue as opposed to hostility. The latest showdown between Turkey and Israel has not prevented Tel Aviv from attending the Asian Cooperation Summit. The Turkish state-run television made sure to show the Israeli delegation walking out as Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad began delivering his speech. Security and cooperation talks were not easy topics at the conference, especially in the presence of both Iran and Israel. The conference quickly turned into debates over the Iranian nuclear program, Gaza, and the Israeli policy that is hampering the peace process. The Iranian president seized the opportunity to send a final message to the UN Security Council, which is about to impose new economic sanctions on Iran. We hope that they will seize the opportunity by accepting the deal we reached with Turkey and Brazil. This opportunity will not come again. Ahmadinejad also warned his old friends, the Russians, against cooperating with the West at the Security Council. The same message, but with a softer tone, was directed by Turkish Prime Minister Recep Tayyip Erdogan to his Russian counterpart, Vladimir Putin. Erdogan called for giving the uranium swap deal a chance. This is how the Russians responded. We worked hard, and I think the Security Council resolution to impose sanctions on Iran has practically been agreed upon. This resolution should not be excessive, should not put Iran's leadership or the Iranian people in a tricky situation that creates barriers in the way of developing Iran's peaceful nuclear energy. The new Turkish mediation attempt to host one last meeting between Ahmadinejad and Putin has not removed the ambiguity surrounding the Russian position which seems to support sanctions on one side and preserve its economic and nuclear cooperation with Tehran on the other. Turkish diplomacy succeeded in bringing the rivals to the same bargaining table. However, some of the participants see no use in the dialogue. Still, others don't seem to speak the same political language as their opponents. Amidst all of this, the picture remains blurry with no definite results appearing on the horizon. Yusuf Sharif, Al Arabiya, Istanbul. to Afghanistan now, where the Taliban have shot down a NATO helicopter in southern part of that country, killing four American soldiers on board. A total of 23 foreign troops, including 11 Americans, have been killed in escalating violence so far this week. Now, a U.S. military spokesman has confirmed that the dead soldiers were American. He said that the copter was brought down in the town of Sangin in Helmand province. The Taliban have claimed responsibility for the attack and say that 20 troops have been killed. Earlier in the day, NATO announced one more troop fatality in an explosion in southern Afghanistan. Military experts told me that the reason behind the recent upsurge of violence is that the U.S. is sending more troops to Afghanistan and the U.S. forces are now going to a massive operation in Kandahar province, southern Afghanistan, to defeat the Taliban militants. But this announcement of a new operation in Kandahar has already worsened the security situation uh, across Afghanistan, especially in southern parts of this country. And this has made the Taliban militants increase their attacks against the foreign troops. Now remaining in Afghanistan, now a former senior Taliban official says British forces have assisted the Taliban in southern Afghanistan. Mullah Abdul Salam Hanifi says that the British forces have trained Taliban militants in Helmand for years. He says they paid every Taliban militant $300 per month. He has also claimed that the Afghan Taliban leader, Mullah Omar, is being kept in the Pakistani city of Karachi. Hanafi was the governor of central Oruzgan province under the Taliban regime. Throngs of mourners from all over the country attended the funeral last night of beloved former Sephardi chief rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu at Har Hot Cemetery in the capital. IBA's Sheila Zucker has the story. 
Over 100,000 mourners from all sectors of the religious spectrum, Sephardi and Ashkenazi, participated in the funeral of former chief Sephardic rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu. The funeral procession, which departed from Hechal Yaakov in the Kiryat Moshe neighborhood, began at 10 p.m. and ended close to 1 a.m. At 4.20 on Monday, surrounded by his family, the spiritual leader of the national religious movement in Israel died after a lengthy hospitalization in Shari Tzedek Medical Center. The 81-year-old sage was born in the old city of Jerusalem to a family with roots in Baghdad. He was recognized as a prodigy at a young age and went on to become Israel's youngest rabbinical court judge, or Dayan. After a long career as a rabbi and Dayan, he was chosen in 1983 as chief Sephardic rabbi, the Rishon Letzion, a position he held until 1993. Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu led the national religious public in matters of law and philosophy and will long be remembered as the Sephardic chief rabbi who encouraged settlement of all the land of Israel, opposed the expulsion from Gush Katif, and expressed disbelief that could occur in a Jewish state. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu issued a statement expressing the national sadness at the loss of a great rabbinic leader. And mayor of Jerusalem, Nir Barkat, eulogized the rabbi as a great Torah leader, someone who loved Israel, and a person who always found the good in people. This is Sheila Zucker for IBA News. More now on the death of Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu, and I'm joined in the studio this evening by Mati Wagner, former religious affairs reporter and now editorial page editor with the Jerusalem Post. Mati, thanks for coming in this evening. How or what will be the legacy of Rabbi Eliyahu? Well, it's important to, um, in order to get a good picture of who Rab Rabbi Mordechai Eliyahu was, it's a good idea to compare him to Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, that these two figures, these two rabbinic figures, are were the greatest Sephardi sages uh, of this generation. And if you look at Rav Avadi Yosef's life, you see that his he worked towards consolidating the Sephardi population, and even set up a political party, um, a cultural movement, an educational system that um, emphasized the Sephardi roots of. Um, of the, of the population, Sephardi population. I think that Rav Mordechai Leah went in a completely different direction. He was more an integrationist. Um, because of his right-wing views, he was kind of co-opted by the uh, National Religious Party. Um, and he um, basically fused, was able to bring together an integration between Sephardi and Ashkenazi Jews to the point where today um, there really is no difference in the national religious uh, population between Sephardi and Ashkenazim. There's marriage between the two, and it's very much different in the in the Haredi population. You note that there's <clears throat> very little intermarriage between Sephardi uh, and, and Ashkenazi Haredi. How will his death affect the religious Zionist settlement movement that he championed for so many years? Um, he was the last great un um, sage that was kind of un there was no one who really could equal his level of, of learning and uh, to our knowledge and therefore it's a great vacuum that's created as a result of his you, of his you mentioned death. this vacuum is there anyone that's going to be able to step in and fill his role not really I mean he has a son and he has there's 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 a rabbi from Ramat Gan the chief rabbi of Ramat Gan Rabbi Yaakov Ariel but uh, there's nobody really of his stature, and I think that uh, we're entering into a new, uh, a new period, a new era, really, in religious Zionism, where you have a lot of different rabbis expressing different opinions, and it could be that um, you know that there are many differences. It's a very diverse um, um, population, the religious Zionist population, and you'll have people who are very much. Um, you know, supportive of the of the government, supportive of any government government policies, are opposed to um, refusing law uh, army orders to, for instance, um, dismantle settlements in in Judea and Samaria, and you have other rabbis that are very much in favor of refusing uh, orders. <laughs> The 
الإذاعات الإلكترونية التي بدأت تغزو صفحات شبكات. Online radio stations have attracted many young Arab journalists because they allow greater freedom of expression than that found in traditional media outlets. الإعلام التقليدية وتقف السلطات الرسمية عاجزة عن فرض القيود. Governments are unable to impose restrictions and censorship on this new form of technological development. Russia today visited the headquarters of the Radio of Our Freedom in Cairo. Modern technology has always played a vital role in opening new doors for self-expression without censorship. Mustafa Fadi is an Egyptian young man who manages the Radio of Our Freedom. He told us that online radio offers great opportunities because government officials are not as involved. However, he added that online radio is not completely free. For Arab listeners, it is a new phenomenon. They are overwhelmed with the flood of modern media, especially over the Internet. Without a doubt, the level of freedom is a lot higher than that in print media or even on usual television channels. However, we still have some kind of censorship because, as you know, we live in Arab countries where freedom of expression is usually restricted. Some believe that political developments in the country might be the main reason behind the birth of online radio stations. It doesn't seem to matter if it's transmitted in text, audio or video. Every day we have new things. Every day we discover new things. Egypt was not like this a few years ago. People are becoming more politically aware and they want to have a choice. They have ideas and they want to explore them. This helps us as journalists because more diversity is created in our field. However, in reality, online radio lacks legislation and laws are needed to protect it. Governments are still unable to monitor this new media over the Internet, but a series of regulatory laws are needed. I think the future is going to be for online newspapers and electronic media in general. These are unconventional venues to express the people's opinions. A large number of young people are moving away from traditional newspapers and towards electronic newspapers. So far, online media is being promoted by the young generations. The young generations are sending clear messages to other young people. Their innovative ideas and visions reflect their ambitions. They are moving away from the routine and the bureaucracy that has drowned the Arab world. People usually try to think of ways to avoid censorship, and therefore the experience of online newspapers and radio stations continue to grant the youth a world of endless opportunities. Amal al Hanewi, Russia Today, Cairo. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.